Book Two of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo, Siege and Storm. Chapter 15 Despite its name, I love the war room. The cartographer in me couldn't resist the old maps wrought in animal hide and embellished in whimsical detail. The gilded lighthouse at Ozcurvo, the mountain temples of the shoe, the mermaids that swam at the edges of the seas. I looked around the table at the faces of the Grisha, some familiar, some new. Any one of them could be a spy for the Darkling, the King, the Operat. Any one of them could be looking for the chance to get me out of the way and assume power. Toya and Tamar stood outside, just to shout away in case of trouble, but it was Mal's presence that gave me comfort. He sat at my right in his rough spun clothes, the sunburst pinned above his heart. I hated to think of him leaving so soon for the hunt, but I had to admit a distraction might be a good thing. Mal had taken pride in being a soldier and, though he tried to hide it, I knew the king's ruling weighed heavily on him. That he'd guessed I was keeping something from him didn't help either. Sergei sat to Mal's right, his arm crossed sullenly over his chest. He wasn't happy to be sitting next to an Akazatsia guard, and he was even less pleased that I'd insisted on seating a fabricator directly to my left in what was considered a position of honor. She was a Suli girl named Paja whom I'd never met before. She had dark hair and nearly black eyes, and the red embroidery at the cuffs of her purple kefta indicated that she was one of the alchemy, fabricators who specialized in chemicals like blasting powders and poisons. David sat further down the table, his cuffs emblazoned in gray. He worked in glass, steel, wood, stone, anything solid. David was a Duras, and I knew he was the best of them because the Darkling had chosen him to forge my collar. Then there was Fyodor, and Zoya beside him, gorgeous as always in ethereal kai blue. Across from Zoya sat Pavel, the dark-skinned Inferni who'd spoken so angrily against me the previous day. He had narrow features and a chipped tooth that whistled slightly when he talked. The first part of the meeting was spent discussing the numbers of Grisha at the various outposts around Ravka and those who might be in hiding. Zoya suggested sending messengers to spread the news of my return and offer full and free pardon to those who swore their allegiance to the Sun Summoner. We spent close to an hour debating the terms and wording of the pardon. I knew I would have to take it to Nikolai for the king's approval, and I wanted to step carefully. Finally, we agreed on loyalty to the Ravkin throne and the Second Army. No one seemed happy with it, so I was pretty sure we'd gotten it right. It was Fyodor who raised the issue of the Operat. It's troubling that he's evaded capture this long. Has he tried to contact you? Pavel asked me. No, I said. I saw the skepticism in his face. He's been spotted in Kirsky and Rivost, said Fyodor. He shows up out of nowhere to preach, then disappears before the king's soldiers can close in. We should think about an assassination, said Sergei. He's growing too powerful, and he could still be colluding with the Darkling. We'd have to find him first, observed Paja. Zoya gave a graceful wave of her hand. What would be the point? He seems bent on spreading word of the Sun Summoner and claiming she's a saint. It's about time the people had some appreciation for the Grisha. Not the Grisha, said Pavel, jutting his chin truculently in my direction. Her. Zoya lifted one elegant shoulder. It's better than them reviling us all as witches and traitors. Let the king do the dirty work, said Fyodor. Let him find the apparat and execute him, and let him suffer the people's wrath. I couldn't believe we were calmly debating a man's murder, and I wasn't sure I wanted the apparat dead. The priest had plenty to answer for, but I wasn't convinced he was working with the Darkling. Besides, he'd given me the Astori Sanctia, and that meant he was a possible source of information. If he was captured, I could only hope the king would keep him alive long enough for questioning. Do you think he believes it? asked Zoya, studying me. That you're a saint risen and back from the dead? I'm not sure it makes a difference. It would help to know just how crazy he is. I'd rather fight a traitor than a zealot, Mal said quietly. It was the first time he'd spoken. I may have some old contacts in the First Army who will still talk to me. There are rumors of soldiers defecting to join him, and if that's the case, they must know where he is. I stole a glance at Zoya. She was gazing at Mal with those impossibly blue eyes. It seemed like she'd spent half the meeting batting her eyelashes at him. Or maybe I was imagining things. She was a powerful squalor and, potentially, a powerful ally. But she'd also been one of the Darkling's favorites, and that certainly made her difficult to trust. I almost laughed out loud. Who was I kidding? I hated even sitting in the same room with her. She looked like a saint. Delicate bones, glossy black hair, perfect skin. All she needed was a halo. Mal paid her no attention, but a twisting feeling in my gut made me think that he was ignoring her a little too deliberately. I knew I had more important things to worry about than Zoya. I had an army to run and enemies on every side, but I couldn't seem to stop myself. I took a breath and tried to focus. The hardest part of the meeting was still to come. As much as I just wanted to curl up somewhere quiet and dark, there were things that needed to be addressed. I looked around the table and said... You need to know what we're up against. The room fell silent. 
It was as if a bell had rung, as if everything that had come before was mere play acting, and now the real meeting had begun. Piece by piece, I laid out what I knew about the Nietzsche Voya, their strength and size, their near invulnerability to bullet and blade, and most important, the fact that they did not fear sunlight. But you escaped, Paja said tentatively, so they must be mortal. My power can destroy them. It's the one thing they don't seem to be able to recover from. But it isn't easy. It requires the cut, and I'm not sure how many I can handle at once. I didn't mention the second amplifier. Even with it, I knew I couldn't withstand the onslaught of a fully formed shadow army, and the fetter was a secret I intended to keep, at least for now. We only escaped because Prince Nikolai got us outside the Darkling's range, I continued. They seemed to need to be close to their master. How close? asked Pavel. I looked to Mao. Hard to say, he replied. A mile? Maybe two? So there's some limit to his power, Fyodor said, with no small amount of relief. Absolutely. I was glad to be able to relate something that wasn't completely dire. He'll have to enter Ravka with his army to get to us. That means we'll have warning and that he'll be vulnerable. He can't summon them the way he summons darkness. The effort seems to cost him. Because it's not a Grisha power, David said. It's Merzost. In Ravkin, the word for magic and abomination was the same. Basic Grisha theory stated that matter couldn't just be created from nothing. But that was a tenet of the small science. Merzost was different, a corruption of the making at the heart of the world. David fiddled with a loose thread of his sleeve. That energy, that substance has to come from somewhere. It must be coming from him. But how is he doing it, asked Zoya? Has there ever been a Grisha with this kind of power? The real question is how to fight them, said Fyodor. Talk turned to defense of the little palace and the possible advantages of confronting the Darkling in the field. But I was watching David. When Zoya had asked about other Grisha, he looked directly at me for the first time since I'd arrived at the little palace. Well, not at me exactly, but at my collar. He'd gone right back to staring at the table, but if possible, he seemed even more uncomfortable than before. I wondered what he might know about Morozova, and I wanted an answer to Zoya's question, too. I didn't know if I had the training or the nerve to attempt such a thing, but was there a way to summon soldiers of light to fight the Darkling Shadow Army? Was that the power the three amplifiers might give me? I meant to try to talk to David alone after the meeting, but as soon as we adjourned, he shot out the door. Any thoughts I had of cornering him in the material kai workshops that afternoon were squelched by the piles of paper waiting for me in my chambers. I spent hours preparing the Grisha pardon and signing countless documents guaranteeing funds and provisions for the outpost the Second Army hoped to reestablish on Ravka's borders. Sergei had tried to manage some of the Darkling's duties, but much of the work had simply gone unattended. Everything seemed to be written in the most confusing way possible. I had to read and reread what should have been simple requests. By the time I made a small dent in the pile, I was late for my dinner, my first meal in the domed hall. I would have preferred to take a tray in my room, but it was important that I assert my presence at the little palace. I also wanted to make sure my commands were being followed and that the Grisha were actually mixing the orders. I sat at the Darkling's table. In an effort to get to know some of the unfamiliar Grisha and to avoid giving them any excuse to form a new elite, I decided that different people would dine with me every night. It was a nice idea, but I had none of Mal's easy way or Nikolai's charm. The conversation was stilted and pockmarked with awkward moments of silence. The other tables didn't seem to be faring much better. The Grisha sat side by side in a jumble of red, purple, and blue, barely speaking. The clink of silverware echoed off the cracked dome. The fabricators had not yet begun their repairs. I didn't know whether to laugh or scream. It was as if I'd asked them to take supper next to a Volcra. At least Sergei and Marie seemed content, even if Nadia looked like she wanted to disappear into the butter dish as they cuddled and cooed beside her. I was happy for them, I suppose, and maybe a little jealous, too. I made a silent count. Forty Grisha, maybe fifty, most of them barely out of school. Some army, I thought with a sigh. My glorious reign was off to a miserable start. Mal had agreed to join the hunting party, and I rose early the next morning to see him off. I was beginning to realize that we would have less privacy at the little palace than we'd had on the road. Between Toya and Tamar and the constantly hovering servants, I'd started to think we might never get a moment alone. I had lain awake the previous night in the Darkling's bed, remembering the way Mal had kissed me at the dacha, wondering if I might hear his knock at my door. I'd even debated crossing the common room and tapping at the guard's quarters, but I wasn't sure who was on duty, and the thought of Toya or Tamar answering made me prickly with embarrassment. In the end, the fatigue of the day must have made the decision for me, because the next thing I knew, it was morning. By the time I reached the Double Eagle Fountain, the path to the palace gates was swarming with people and horses. Vasily and his aristocrat friends in their elaborate riding regalia, first army officers in their sharp uniforms, and behind them, a legion of servants in white and gold. I found Mal checking his saddle near a group of royal trackers. 
He was easy to pick out in his peasant rough spun. He had a gleaming new bow on his back and a quiver of arrows fletched in the pale blue and gold of the Rothkin King. The formal Rothkin hunt forbade the use of firearms, but I noticed that several of the servants had rifles on their backs, just in case the animals proved to be too much for their noble masters. Quite a show, I said, coming up beside him. Just how many people does it take to bring down a few boar? Mal snorted. This is nothing. Another group of servants left before dawn to set up the camp. Saints forbid a prince of Ravka should be kept waiting on a hot cup of tea. A horn blew and the riders began to fall into place in a clatter of hooves and clanking stirrups. Mal shook his head and gave a firm tug on the cinch. These boar had better be deaf, he grumbled. I glanced around at the glittering uniforms and high-polished boots. Maybe I should have outfitted you in something a little more... shiny. There's a reason peacocks aren't birds of prey, he said with a grin. It was an easy, open smile, the first I'd seen in a long time. He's happy to be going, I realized. He's grumbling about it, but he's glad. I tried not to take it personally. And you're like a big brown hawk, I asked. Exactly. Or an overlarge pigeon? Let's stick with hawk. The others were mounting up, turning their horses to join the rest of the party as they headed down the gravel path. Let's go, Aretsev, called the tracker with sandy hair. I felt suddenly awkward, keenly aware of the people surrounding us, of their inquisitive stares. I had probably breached some kind of protocol by even coming to say goodbye. Well, I said, patting his horse's flank, have fun. Try not to shoot anyone. Got it. Wait, don't shoot anyone? I smiled, but it felt a bit forced. We stood there a moment longer, the silence stretching out between us. I wanted to fling my arms around him, bury my face in his neck, and make him promise to be safe, but I didn't. A rueful smile touched his lips. He bowed. Moi souverainie, he said. My heart twisted in my chest. He climbed into the saddle and kicked his horse forward, disappearing in a sea of riders flowing toward the golden gates. I made the walk back to the little palace in low spirits. It was early, but the day was already growing warm. Tamar was waiting for me when I emerged from the wooded tunnel. He'll be back soon enough, she said. No need to look so glum. I know, I replied, feeling foolish. I managed to laugh as we crossed the lawn down to the stables. At Karamzin, I had a doll I made out of an old sock that I used to talk to when he was away hunting. Maybe that would make me feel better. You were an odd little girl. You have no idea. What did you and Tolia play with? The skulls of our enemies? I saw the glint in her eye, and we both burst out laughing. Down at the training rooms, Tamara and I met briefly with Bakken, the instructor tasked with preparing Grisha for physical combat. The old mercenary was instantly enchanted with Tamar, and they yammered away at each other in Shu for nearly ten minutes before I managed to raise the issue of training the fabricators. Bakken can teach anyone to fight, he said in his thick accent. The dim light gave the ropey scar at his throat a pearly sheen. Taught little girl to fight, no? Yes, I agreed, wincing at the memory of Bakken's grueling drills and the beatings I'd taken at his hands. But little girl is not so little anymore, he said, taking in the gold of my kefta. You come back to train with Bakken. I hit big girl same as little girl. That's very egalitarian of you, I said, and hurried Tamar out of the stables before Bakken decided to show me just how fair-minded he could be. I went straight from the stables to another war council meeting. Then I just had time to tidy my hair and brush off my kefta before heading back to the Grand Palace to join Nikolai as the king's advisors briefed him on Azalta's defenses. I felt a bit like we were children who had intruded on the adults. The advisors made it clear that they felt we were wasting their time. But Nikolai seemed unfazed. He asked careful questions about armaments, the number of troops stationed around the city walls, the warning system that was in place in case of attack. Soon the advisors had lost their condescending air and were conversing with him in earnest, asking about the weaponry he brought with him from across the fold and how it might be best deployed. He had given me a short description of the Nietzsche Voya to help make the case for arming the Grisha with new weapons as well. The advisors were still deeply suspicious of the Second Army, but on the walk back to the little palace, Nikolai seemed unconcerned. They'll come around in time, he said. That's why you need to be there, to reassure them and to help them understand that the Darkling isn't like other enemies. You think they don't know that? I asked incredulously. They don't want to know it. If they can maintain the belief that the Darkling can be bargained with or brought to heel, then they don't have to face the reality of the situation. I can't say I blame them, I said gloomily. It was all well and good to talk about troops and walls and warnings, but I doubted it would make much difference against the Darkling's shadow soldiers. When we emerged from the tunnel, Nikolai said, Walk with me down to the lake? I hesitated. I promise not to drop to one knee and start composing ballads to your beauty. I just want to show you something. My cheeks went red and Nikolai grinned. You should see if the Korporaki can do something about that blush, he said, and strolled off around the side of the little palace to the lake.
I was tempted to follow him just for the pleasure of pushing him in. Although, could the Corporal Rocky fix my blushing? I shook the ridiculous thought from my head. The day I asked a Corporal Nick to tend to my blushes was the day I'd be laughed out of the little palace. Nikolai had stopped on the gravel path halfway down to the lake, and I joined him there. He pointed to a strip of beach on the far shore, a short distance from the school. I want to construct a pier there, he said. Why? So I can rebuild the hummingbird. You really can't keep still, can you? Don't you have enough on your plate? He squinted out at the glittering surface of the lake. Alina, I'm hoping we can find a way to defeat the Darkling. But if we can't, we need a way to get you out. I stared at him. What about the rest of the Grisha? There's nothing I can do for them. I couldn't quite believe what he was suggesting. I'm not going to run. I had a feeling you'd say that, he said with a sigh. And you, I said angrily, are you just going to fly away and leave the rest of us to face the Darkling? Come now, he said. You know I've always wanted a hero's funeral. He looked back at the lake. I'm happy to go down fighting, but I don't want my parents left to the Darkling's mercy. Will you give me two squalors to train? They're not gifts, Nikolai, I said, thinking of the way the Darkling had made a present of Jenya to the Queen. But I'll ask for volunteers. Just don't tell them what it's for. I don't want the others to get discouraged. Or start vying for places aboard the craft. And one more thing, I said. I want you to make room for Bagra. She shouldn't have to face the Darkling again. She's been through enough. Of course, he said, then added. I still believe we can win, Alina. I'm glad someone does, I thought dismally, and turned to go inside.